Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, good afternoon. My name is Sue Ellen Brakey, and I am the um, Associate Director of the Center for Climate Change, Climate Justice, and Health at the MGH Institute of Health Professions, which is located in Boston, and it's the academic arm of the um, Mass General Brigham System. And I'm joined by um, Drs. Winnie Armand and Greg, Dr. Greg Fury. Winnie, um, Dr. Armand is with the MGH Center for Environment and Health, and Dr. Fury is with Brigham and Women's Hospital. So we welcome you today, um, and we're excited to have Dr. Shanda DeMorest here with us, who will be talking um, to us about climate smart healthcare. So before I hand it over to Shanda, um, just a little bit about her. She is the Associate Director for Climate Engagement and Education at Healthcare Without Harm and Practice Green Health, where she supports decarbonization and climate smart healthcare delivery throughout the sector. Dr. DeMorest earned her Doctorate of Nursing Practice in Health Innovation and Leadership from the University of Minnesota and she holds the LEAD Green Associate Credential through the U.S. Green Building Council. A cardiovascular nurse with horticultural training, Shanda is co-founder of the Nurses Climate Challenge, a national campaign to educate 50,000 health professionals about the health impacts of climate change. Dr. DeMorris also serves as an affiliate faculty member at the University of Minnesota School of Nursing. So welcome, Shanda. Thank you so much, Sue Ellen. It's an honor to join you. And um, Winnie and Greg, thank you for the invitation to spend some time with this community today. I'm gonna get a screen share going here. Excellent. And just to do a verbal check, are you able to see the slide set that I have pulled up? Yes. Terrific, thanks to Ellen. Wonderful, well, let's get going. Welcome everybody. I'm so glad that you're taking the time to join us today. Um, as Sue Ellen opened up, we'll be spending our hour together talking about climate smart healthcare and what that can mean for health professionals in this space. Just to present my, uh, my background here and any conflicts, um, I do work for Healthcare Without Harm and Practice Green Health. Um, I'll tell you more about those organizations shortly, um, but we are um, a membership-based organization that is paid for by hospitals. Um, the Healthcare Without Harm branch of our work is funded by private donors. So I'd like to start with my story. Um, I am zooming in from Anchorage, Alaska today where it's 13 degrees and actually my, my heat went out overnight. So I'm all bundled up and cozied up, um, but the, the cold winters are not new to me. I'm, I'm from Minnesota originally. And this is an image that I took from our, um, our state uh, courthouse in Caledonia, Minnesota. It's of Houston County. And the area that I grew up in, La Crescent, Minnesota, bordered the Mississippi River. It's right at the corner of the state. So we're, we're in an area called the Driftless Region, where during the last ice age, the glaciers would kind of approach the area and then recede. And the glaciers would approach the area and then recede. And that led to a really unique topography in the southeast corner of Minnesota and Wisconsin and Iowa for from the region. So I grew up in an area with bluffs and rivers and valleys. Um, we are in an agricultural area, um, primarily actually fruit production, or the apple capital of the state, but there's definitely a lot of soy and, and uh, corn growth. My family is not agricultural by background, but we spent a lot of time outdoors. Um, my grandfather and my uncle and, and my stepfather had me outside all the time. Um, they were hunters and trappers. So I grew up um, with them outside. We did foraging for morel mushrooms and ginseng and, and that was kind of the way that I learned about the world. 
at the same time, um, I, I lived in an area that wasn't particularly beneficial for my own health. Um, this, this little smiley face is me in my early years. And um, I grew up in a trailer park uh, for a long time with a single mom who loved me so much, also kind of led me through a lot of secondhand smoke exposure and some environmental um, situations that led to me having asthma and allergies and having a different experience with my indoor and eventually my outdoor environment as well. So I like to share this story because it planted the seeds early in my life of what it meant to be outside in nature and how important that was for me as a young human. And at the same time, dealing with some, some health issues that are not all that uncommon that impacted the way that that my growth and my learning and my, my well-being um, was as a young person. Eventually I went to nursing school. I tried to pull in that natural component of, of my love, my, of my life. Um, and that led me on my path to working with healthcare without harm and practice green health as a nurse. So certainly my environmental health experiences of, of asthma and allergies as examples are, are not unique and the environment impacts the health of people all across the globe. That's why we're here. That's why we're having this conversation today. And at the same time, we know that the health impacts of climate change, which range from experiences of um, outdoor air pollutants, wildfire, severe weather, extreme heat, that those burdens are not experienced equally across populations in the same way that COVID-19 has um, increased burden on vulnerable and marginalized populations. Climate change serves as a disease exacerbator. It serves as a force multiplier. And so the probably the same communities in um, lower socioeconomic status that, that I grew up in are facing more impacts of climate change than folks in higher socioeconomic status, for instance, or other marginalized populations, communities of, of black, brown, indigenous, other people of color, um, communities with lower education, etc. And so certainly when we consider ourselves health providers and working at this intersection, it's critical that we're integrating our understanding of health impacts of climate change. And then the other side of this is how can we take action? And that'll bring in climate smart healthcare, which we'll get into. The challenge from an ethical perspective is the sector that we all work in, the sector that um, we dedicate our lives to simultaneously contributes to climate change and certainly other environmental health threats as well. Um, estimates are, are demonstrating that about eight and a half percent of our nation's greenhouse gas emissions come from healthcare. And certainly there are practices that we can improve upon as individual practitioners and as health system leaders. At the same time, we know that we're operating within a system in the U.S. and, and actually globally, of course, that is very dependent on the fossil fuel economy and that is very entrenched in utilizing coal, oil, natural gas to light our hospitals, to run our equipment and our machines, to help us take care of patients that really need health care. Um, but we have a system on our hands that needs redesigning. So for me, that means working at Practice Green Health and Healthcare Without Harm. And you're probably familiar with these organizations. Um, Healthcare Without Harm came onto the scene about 26 years ago, originally to help get mercury out of healthcare. Um, at the time, mercury was showing up in thermometers, blood pressure cuff devices, and the primary way that hospitals were getting rid of that waste was to incinerate it and often on site. When you're incinerating mercury, it is released into the air and into the water and poisoning the same communities that these health systems were seeking to provide care for. So Healthcare Without Harm developed originally as an advocacy organization to right that wrong. Over time, the org has grown to be much more inclusive of other environmental um, 
advocacy as well. So the three goals um, that we operate under presently are to protect public health from climate change, knowing that it's identified as the number one public health threat of our century. We also work with health systems um, to transform the supply chain, knowing that somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 to 80% of greenhouse gas emissions are part of the supply chain for healthcare. So those solutions require partnership with vendors, manufacturers, distributors, et cetera. And then our third goal is to build leadership for environmental health. And this is a critical place that health professionals can jump in. Practice Green Health is the arm of the organization that provides technical assistance and resources to hospitals all across the country. Currently, we have over 1,500 hospital members. And if there's anybody on the line that's outside of the US, we also um, have an international group that's very similar to Practice Green Health. It's called Global Green and Healthy Hospitals. And so it's a similar framework um, providing environmental sustainability support for hospitals all across the world. And so over time, as we have narrowed our focus, how do you narrow a focus to climate change of all environmental issues? Um, but that's the term I'll use, narrowed the focus to addressing climate. We've established a framework called Climate Smart Healthcare. And oftentimes we hear a lot about momentum in, I would say generally in business sectors increasing in the past few years of climate change mitigation or managing a carbon footprint or decreasing emissions. All of that is critical, but there are a couple other pieces of climate that we need to factor in, especially when we're thinking about how health sector comes into play. Um, so I've, I've referenced this, this mitigation portion of this diagram that relates to preventing future climate change from exacerbating or getting worse in the future. And the metric that we're talking about here is emissions. We're expanding beyond carbon dioxide emissions, that's typically considered the N or the constant when we think about emissions from any sector. But there are a lot of other nasty greenhouse gases that come from healthcare too. The objective of our mitigation work in climate smart healthcare is to reduce those emissions now and in the future. At the same time, we need to also be focusing on resilience. A term that's probably you know, closer to the tip of your tongue here is climate adaptation. So how are we helping the, the individuals, the communities, and in our case, the hospitals and health systems that are already facing climate impacts be able to manage those situations and be stronger and more resilient in the future? And the third pillar of climate smart healthcare is leadership. And so for us at Healthcare Without, Without Harm, that shows up most often in forms of education. So for multiple audiences, both sustainability professionals in healthcare, and then as it comes to my work as a nurse on our team, health professionals. And then we also support health system advocacy. So I'll go through each of these aspects of climate smart healthcare. We'll describe it a little more. I'll provide some examples um, and then we'll shift into a dialogue later in our time together today. So when it comes to mitigation, we need a vision. And the Paris Climate Accords in 2015 presented that international vision, which is to reach net zero emissions by mid-century, by 2050, and we are creeping up, creeping up very quickly to that time. In response, um, Healthcare Without Harm took a look at the health sector in the U.S., but also globally, to get an idea of what that will take to reach net zero emissions by 2050. We released something called the Global Roadmap for Healthcare Decarbonization. Decarbonization is another term that we use for mitigation, um, but I think it's a little limiting because it seems like we're only referencing carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas emission, but we're also looking at the broader picture. So I want to draw attention 
got a double screen here. So excuse me for a moment while I drive my cursor through a couple points that I'd like to share with folks. This upper line on this graph demonstrates the health sector's emissions if we continue on a business as usual um, operation. The color-coded categories are outlined here below and they provide an estimate of the quantity of emissions in the health sector globally that will be reduced by various actions throughout the sector. So for example, let's point out the, the really big categories here. This blue section right at the top gives an estimate of our emissions reduction if we power healthcare with 100% clean, renewable electricity. That'll have a big impact. This green section here is pertaining to investing in zero emissions building and infrastructure, our built environment. Now, certainly health professionals can have a role in those areas especially as it pertains to advocacy. We can use our voices to encourage and influence our health system leadership or our local or state or federal policymakers to help establish systems and structures that can have an impact at this level. But oftentimes our day-to-day -day operations don't really pertain to renewable electricity or the built environment. So these other categories are more clinically oriented or at least individually oriented enough that we can engage in them and, and have an impact on decarbonization within the sector. So just to point out a couple that I really like, a few options for our impact. This purple section below pertains to the work that you're doing every day to take care of patients, increasing efficiency. Now some of this can show up in healthcare prevention. I like thinking about Mm, preventative health and disease prevention as climate mitigation. If we are able to build a healthier population and work with patients to help them understand how to improve their own health situations and practice health promotion behaviors, it is less likely that they will encounter the diseases and the illnesses in the future that might be chronic or that might be highly resource intensive. If we keep patients healthier and communities healthier, they'll need fewer resources in the future because they'll be facing fewer chronic diseases. That fewer resources takes fewer, uh, fewer physical materials, but also releases fewer emissions. Or a couple other clinically oriented options here. Number five, this red band pertains to low carbon pharmaceuticals. So even if you're not a pharmacist, think about the ways in which you're working with patients where there's a touch point on medications, probably just about every instance. So I like to look to the global roadmap for healthcare decarbonization for the big vision um, and to help us see that there's certainly hope for ways in which we can reduce those emissions collectively as a sector. Now let's look a little bit more closely on some, at some data from health systems. So each year at Practice Green Health, we, um, we go through what we call our Environmental Excellence Awards, and hundreds of health systems across the country are sharing their real data from their sustainability initiatives across a wide range of categories. Climate and emissions are, are just one category. We collect a lot of information related to chemicals, for example, or waste, for example. Of course, they have connection with climate. Um, but to look at some of the emissions more specifically as an example, this is data from 2019. Um, and I believe that year we had somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 hospitals contribute their emissions data. So this gives an estimate of where healthcare is releasing the, the um, proportionate uh, emissions across all the categories of hospital emissions. So for instance, let's take a look at um, electricity since we were drawing that from the global roadmap for healthcare decarb. It's estimated that about 12% of healthcare emissions comes from electricity. How about this big one down here, this green? Investments, health sector investments are estimated to uh, contribute about 
of the sector's greenhouse gas emissions. That's not direct care. Here's a large sector up here, purchased goods and services. Now, there's there are other aspects of supply chain that are represented in these smaller categories as well. As you might imagine, supply chain emissions are extremely difficult to quantify. They're also extremely difficult to decrease. Um, but we certainly see here that there's a large percentage of health sector emissions that come from the materials and supplies that we're using. And think all the way back to the beginning of life of that IV kit or that um, OR kit. Where were those materials sourced? Where were they packaged? Where were they shipped from? What, was it across the, um, across the ocean? What happened when it got onto US soil? How heavy duty were the trucks that were taking this equipment to and fro? Now we need all of these materials or we need most of these materials to provide care, but it behooves us to think more strategically about the materials and supplies that we're using to take care of our patients because it all contributes to our emissions. So I'd like to share some excellent news, some great news about the momentum that has been building in our sector as a response to measuring emissions in the first place as a component of greenhouse gas emission reduction. And then some of the national and international pledges or commitments that have grown as a result of this. So we have seen um, health system momentum show up from our organization. We see the Healthcare Climate Challenge, which is a public commitment to reduce those emissions and integrate resilience as a health system. We've seen the Healthcare Climate Council, which is a group of 20 health institutions across the US that are the most progressive climate actors in the space. MG, uh, MGB is one of our climate council members. We see the National Academy of Medicine Action Collaborative on decarbonizing our whole health, health sector. That, that to me is almost unbelievable. Five years ago, we would not have been um, learning about external climate action out of, um, out of some of the nonprofit and environmental work that's happening. Or at the HHS level, Health and Human Services, we have the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity that was established to drive change in the sector. We have the race to zero, which is a UN-led initiative that is multi-sectoral, where uh, in the case of healthcare, systems are signing up to reduce their emissions directly in alignment with the Paris Climate Accords. So 50% reduction in emissions by 2030 and 100% reduction across all scopes by 2050. And another example of system leadership is the Cool Food Pledge. This is led by the World Resources Institute, and health systems are signing up for this to reduce their emissions within their cafeterias and their patient and staff meals, for example. So we have momentum. We have demonstrated external public commitments to this work, and this is building all the time. And it's building in our government as well. So at the end of 2021, the Biden administration released an executive order mandating decarbonization for federal healthcare facilities. So that shows that in the sense of VAs and defense health admin hospitals and clinics. Then at the beginning of 2022, that HHS um, Office of Climate Change and Health Equity put forward a health sector climate pledge that's in alignment with the work that's happening at the federal healthcare level. And this is a pledge that is open publicly now um, to all health systems and actually other health companies um, across the country to get in line. And actually as of, I think it was just a couple of days ago, March 9th, they reopened that HHS pledge. It had been closed for a little bit to draw attention and to um, sort of celebrate the initial health systems that signed on, of which there were over 800 hospitals, and now it's reopened again. So these links are live. Um, maybe one of my colleagues can drop the link into the chat here. See if your health system is a signer of the HHS pledge. 
What that means is those health systems are committing to reducing their org's emissions 50% by 2030, this will bring about, and 100% by 2050 in scopes one and two emissions. So really those pertain to the operational emissions that are used on site. It doesn't get into some of that supply chain work. Um, but another agreement of that HHS pledge is to quantify all those emissions that are being released on the hospital at as part of the health system um, operations and supply chain purchases. So they're requiring um, or asking for that full quantification. And then the third component of the HHS pledge is that hospitals develop climate resilience plans in collaboration with the communities where those health systems are located and um, identifying a lead executive to support the work. So while the pledge is voluntary, while there are certainly aspects where it could have a little bit more in terms of teeth, what it does is demonstrates momentum, it builds peer pressure, and it provides leverage for health leadership to demonstrate that they're taking action on climate, bit by bit. So the second part of climate smart healthcare is resilience. At Healthcare Without Harm, we again have a three pillar model. Um, and oftentimes resilience is, is often thought of along the lines of emergency preparedness or emergency management, and it's really facility oriented. We know that that won't cut it when it comes to healthcare because we're trying to build healthier populations and we know that that exists outside of the four walls of our hospitals. So when we think about climate resilience, we do include the healthcare facility component, the built environment component, but we need to go beyond that as a sector. We need to look at public infrastructure resilience. Thinking about any storm can, um, you know, maybe folks will recall how the, the built environment in the sense of um, roads, buildings, utilities, um, power, et cetera, that can be severely damaged by any climate impact and that has a follow-up with human health. And the community health component. So are patients and families and, and communities within their settings able to withstand climate impacts? Are they able to um, reduce their own likelihood to exposure to those climate vulnerabilities? So for us, climate resilience extends beyond the facilities. And as a, as a reminder for that HHS pledge, that was one of the key requirements for health systems that were publicly committing to that action was to build a plan for climate resilience. I know this text is a little bit small, but I wanted to pull out some content from our Safe Haven in the Storm report that was released in 2017. Um, the subtitle of this is The Costs of Being Ill-Prepared. And sometimes for health systems, oftentimes for health systems, one of the strongest levers for taking action can be the bottom line. And so this report adds the dollar sign to the cost of not being prepared for those climate impacts. And the, um, the image on the right here goes through different disruptions that can occur to a health system when it faces a climate crisis or climate disaster, anywhere from standard clinical operations to disruptions in supply chain, for example. This also outlines the costs related to um, capital, related to direct and indirect impacts, and then some of the longer term reduced revenue that can show up for health systems in the sense of reduced clinical demand or even lower reimbursement rates. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at this resource. And if you're in a health system that is thinking about um, how it can become more resilient to climate change, not only the health effects that patients are experiencing, but also the physical effects in, in the sense of a facility or community. This is a really lovely resource to draw from. 
One case study that exists within it, and, and there are several, um, is Superstorm Sandy's impact on NYU Langone, which is a health system in and around New York City. So NYU Langone in, in 2012 experienced extreme impacts from the hur from Hurricane Sandy across all those um, areas that we just referenced. So operationally, um, they had to evacuate all of their patients. Clinically, they, their, their patients were um, experiencing things in the communities where they were seeking care, um, NYU Langone sort of being anchor institutions within their communities. So when communities face these extreme storms, where do you, where do you go? The health system. And if the health system or that hospital is evacuated or shut down or unable to provide care, Technically, that's that's you know certainly um, providing major human health impacts or or not being able to care for major human health impacts. But there are also financial uh, losses that occur for that health system. Um, NYU Langone was interesting, and one of their facilities had. Um, it was an academic medical center, and so it had a lot of research um, in the basement. And they lost over 10,000 rodents that were part of that research. So not only was there, there that loss of life, but years and years of clinical research that was unable to be recaptured and also unable to be quantified in the sense of dollars for those insurance reimbursement rates. So the total cost of loss for NYU Langone was almost one and a half billion dollars. And the loss certainly extends beyond, you know, a few of the touch points that I referenced there. Um, but this is where it hit home for them, that they really needed to take action and be better prepared for the inevitable or the, you know, the next time this would happen again. So over time, they have really increased their, um, their patient resilience in terms of being able to provide care for community members that were facing these same climate impacts. They increased their built infrastructure. Um, they did that via a couple different institutions that you might be familiar with. So via the U.S. Green Building Council, they um, have pursued LEED. And so not only have their um, reinforced facilities been, uh, you know, brought up to speed and able to serve the typical clinical operations, but now they've done that in a sustainable fashion where they are able to mitigate future impacts because of integrated and deliberate design up front to face some of those winds, flooding, et cetera. And they're also, um, their buildings are also peer rated. So performance excellence in electricity renewal. Being in New York City, they are on the NYC grid and there are and there are a lot of buildings drawing from those power grids. And so by being um, uh, sort of, a, a, you know, wiser up front for a more resilient system will prevent um, future issues from losing power uh, next time a storm hits. NYU Langone is also part of the Healthcare Climate Council and they just joined the HHS pledge. So this is just one example. Certainly there are a multitude of other health systems that experience climate impacts across all realms that we've referenced. We've seen a lot of um, challenging stories in the news, specifically out West with health systems facing wildfire damage, for example, or in the Southeast, um, another, you know, more hurricane and flooding examples. Um, we can think of some from Hurricane Ian at the end of 2022 down in Florida. Wherever your systems are located, you will be facing some sort of climate impact. And so evaluating the risk and where those gaps are will help um, help your system build much more tailored and specific plans to be resilient in the future. 
another case study comes out of um, the western part of the U.S. in Kaiser Permanente. Um, a lot of fires and um, follow-up blackouts from those wildfires have faced California health systems for several years. And so KP um, tackled climate resilience by um, building microgrids at several of their clinics. And what's unique about this um, initiative is that clinics that have microgrids, and these are solar microgrids, they're able to draw energy from that if they lose power um, at the municipal level. And in these communities, the, there are businesses and homes that are also tapped into this microgrid structure. So this is a lovely example of resilience because it really demonstrates the example of these clinics serving as anchor institutions in the event of some of these major climate impacts. And one thing um, that I'll share that we're doing on the Healthcare Without Harm and Practice Green Health side is we are working to help the health systems that have signed on to the pledge, that HHS pledge, build climate resilience plans. And we're doing this in alignment with our climate resilience framework. So moving beyond the facility piece and lifting up the critical aspect of community resilience and public infrastructure resilience. So if you happen to work in a health system that is a part of the practice green health family, that's something that you can join us in doing is working in a cohort, actually peer to peer model. We're pairing health systems in geographic regions um, of similar um, sort of shape and, and size to build plans that are um, that it contribute to increased resilience not only within a health system, but in an entire geography. And another resource I'll share here, we have our guide to community-based climate resilience planning. And this resource is lovely. I have it linked at the end of the uh, slide set in that, it provides the modality for engaging with what we call the end user, the patient or the community that is um, intended to be aided by building climate resilience plans. Oftentimes we hear the adage, um, you know, maybe nothing about me without me when we think about patient care. The same goes for developing climate resilience planning. When we are aiming to um, help health systems and communities be able to adapt better in the future, it serves us best, it serves the community best by doing that together. And so this resource provides step-by-step -step plans for how a health system can work with community members and community-based organizations and even government and municipal entities to collectively establish next steps. So that last pillar of climate smart healthcare is leadership. So I've referenced the Healthcare Climate Council a couple times now. This is a list of all of the current members. And when I did that little spin around, um, we have five systems that are participating in Race to Zero. So that international um, agreement to shoot for total emissions reduction across all scopes by 2050. Now, I'd like to shed a little light on these health systems because they didn't get here overnight. And certainly health system leadership in each of these entities has been imperative in getting on board to take action um, for climate change, not only at that mitigation, but also the resilience and the advocacy level as well. And for health professionals, we know that change can start with us. We're trusted. Um, we are working with the patients and the families and the community members that are facing these crises. And we have the ear of folks all across the nation. We have a really interesting role in that we can be the mouthpieces of the patients that we're working with for our health system leadership. We can simultaneously be the ones to help patients be more resilient themselves outside of the four walls of the hospital. What are the, um, what are the 
illnesses and challenges that your patient community is facing and how might climate change exacerbate those issues, we can teach them about how to be safer and how to protect themselves better. Um, I also like to elevate health sector leadership in the terms of health professionals because we can influence leadership across our system to take bolder action, whether it's these public commitments that I'm referencing or whether it's, um, you know, taking step by step, identifying staffing or a structure or even just a committee within your health institution to address climate or sustainability more broadly. The spectrum of allies might look familiar to folks from the advocacy realm, and we do know that there will always be a contingent of, of individuals who may not necessarily be easily convinced that climate is in the realm of the health sector mandate. There may be folks that certainly have priorities that seem to supersede what we're facing in, in the healthcare sector when it comes to climate. Although likely most of y'all see those interconnections between climate and staffing, or perhaps climate and well-being of, um, of employees within a health system, or climate and finance. Um, and so I encourage you to think about when you're, you're leveraging leadership within your system, what are the items that folks care about? What's keeping your C-suite up at night? How might you leverage aspects of climate smart healthcare and weave those into the hot button topics that your systems are paying attention to? The same can go for outside of a clinical care setting, whether it's in academia, whether it's in public health or government health. And one initiative I'd like to um, share about in particular for the nurses on the line, but also for others who might be thinking about similar frameworks is the Nurses Climate Challenge. So in um, 2017, the milieu is a lot different when it came to climate uh, as a conversational topic, when it came to climate in the news. And so a, a group of um, folks from Healthcare Without Harm and Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments came together under the auspices of building momentum in the nursing profession for taking action on climate. We so, soon learned that in order to take action, nurses or health professionals need to understand what that means and the why behind it. So really, how does climate change impact patient health? And so we built an educational infrastructure, a peer-to-peer -peer educational framework where nurses were teaching one another and eventually students about how climate has impacts for patients. And over time, we've grown into a community of nurses um, that is all across the world. We have nurses in about 40 different nations that are educating their colleagues about climate. Um, at the end of 2022, we just ticked over that number of, of 50,000 as our goal for our reach. And we also developed something called the School of Nursing Commitment as a response to seeing faculty using the Nurses Climate Challenge to educate their students. Um, and the MGH Institute of Health Professionals is one of our groups or one, one of our um, institutions that's part of that School of Nursing Commitment. And we're always trying to elevate the work that nurses, physicians, and other health professionals are doing at Healthcare Without Harm. Um, and so I'll, I'll particularly point to um, uh, Sue Ellen, Dr. Sue Ellen Brakey in the upper right here, but we hosted podcasts um, featuring nursing faculty and other interdisciplinary health educators um, that have been working with the School of Nursing Commitment over time. And um, if you're interested to learn what other folks are doing in this realm or get a little inspiration, I encourage you to take a listen. And if you are from the physician realm, um, we also have a group called the Physician Network at Healthcare Without Harm, which is a contingent of folks all across the country and beyond that gather, that um, share best practices, they participate in a journal club. Dr. Greg Fury is very involved. Um, and at Clean Men, 
in a couple months in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the nurses, the physicians, the sustainability professionals, the community organizations, some uh, policy leaders are all gathering to convene around climate smart healthcare and sustainability in our sector more broadly. So if any of this has been enticing to you, I certainly invite you to consider joining us either in person in Pittsburgh, or we have a virtual option for Clean Med as well. And so as I close, just to take a few actionable potential steps here, certainly continue to learn about climate impacts that are happening in your region. The more local and specific you make this work, the more likely you are to build that community and be able to take action and, and build plans for resilience that are relevant and timely for what you're facing in your communities. Uh, if you have a, a role in which you are working with patients, have these conversations with them. Find your community. Um, if you are uh, of a specific discipline of some of the groups that I've referenced on the line, do a Google. I saw uh, Sue Ellen dropped a couple links in here. Excellent. Thank you. Figure out who's doing this work, not only nationally, but most importantly, in your own backyard. Is there a health, is there a sustainability committee or a green team at your health system? Um, is there one at your school? And if not, find others who would like to build that with you. Um, and lead the movement. So not only can we leverage our health leaders who have ultimate decision-making for some of this work, but we can change our practice. We can change our practice in healthcare. We can change our practice at home. So think about ways you can decarbonize aspects of your clinical care. And if you wanna really take it to the next level, maybe even pitch a position for somebody who can lead this work at your institution. There's been momentum building around roles for clinical directors of sustainability or medical or nursing directors of sustainability. And we have the perfect opportunity to merge what's happening in our environment with our roles in health systems. So certainly this is a powerful moment in history. I think every moment can be a powerful moment in history. Um, but when we think about our roles as health professionals in climate smart health care, there is a space for every one of us to be more mindful, to be more active, and to be more inspirational for others around us to take action as well. So with that, I'd love to open up for questions. I'll shut down my screen share here. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Damaris. That was that was really inspiring. Um, it, it was great to hear all of Healthcare Without Harm's pillars and the initiatives and opportunities for all of us to participate in. So thank you for that talk. Um, there are already a few questions, and I encourage everybody to continue to put more into the Q&A, and hopefully we'll get through most of them. Um, so just starting off, you had, um, in one of your slides, you had depicted all the components of the healthcare system's footprint. And one big chunk was uh, a financial investments. Um, one question for you, um, it was 28%. And I'm wondering if that number is the hospital's investments or whether that also included the employee uh, retirement individual investments. And if you could also um, take the opportunity here to explain more to our, our audience about what that actually means, why is that such a big chunk of the footprint? Excellent question. Yeah, thank you for that. So I'm simultaneously going to track down our report on health care's climate footprint, which is where I drew this from. So grab that resource. I'll start with the caveat that across sectors, measuring greenhouse gas emissions is very much an art. It's not an exact science. It never will be an exact science because they're continuous. Emissions are always being released as part of operations. All of that being said, right now, best practice is to do the best you can with that emission uh, quantification. Related to the investment question, so that is basically that constitutes 
um, the health systems investments primarily in the fossil fuel industries that have the highest quantity of emissions. Um, 401ks are typically structured in that individuals, they have some autonomy over, um, over the portfolio and sort of the proportions that they can adjust for sometimes different stocks or different mutual funds that have various um, you know, proportions of investments in some of these uh, funds that have greater presentation of fossil fuel industry. Um, but primarily it's it's ubiquitous. And so that 28% really gets at the comprehensive system investment um, emissions. Now, if you looked at this as an individual and said, I went through my portfolio and divested, if that even is an option with the 401k um, that your employer goes through, it might look a little bit different for you. It might look different for every individual, but that's a composite of the health system. And at, with that, it's an estimate of the composite for the health system. Thank you. And I'll just take this opportunity in case we have MGB employees on the call that MGB last year has started to offer two funds that are considered ESG funds as an alternative to the target um, default funds. And it just really takes a simple phone call or online a few seconds. If to make that switch, there's also the opportunity to do your own brokerage and do your own, you know, more, I think, detailed. Um, but certainly I, I would uh, encourage anybody who's interested in more information to talk to the um, human resources to find out more information about that. That's exciting. And, and there's a little bit of momentum for some health systems offering those divestment options. And so looking to systems like MGB to say, you know, there, there are so many employees within that system that can really leverage and, and build momentum behind that. I think there are a couple others in Boston, but not many that come to mind. Um, so you're on the cutting edge. Yes, I, I have a few colleagues who actually deserve a lot of credit and really, and, and Greg and, as well on this call, who have been very active in trying to advocate for that. So um, work in progress, uh, for sure. Um, so the other, some of the other questions in here that uh, one of the, um, I think it has to do with the, the innovation that we need to make our um, economy more circular. And do you think there's a role for uh, meshing, integrating the healthcare system with entrepreneurship? And, and can you give any examples and, and or give folks uh, a way to get started? Oh, what a cool question. Absolutely. Um, a couple examples come to mind. So there is an individual called the Solar RN. I believe she's out of, she's somewhere in New England. And basically she, um, like me, or probably like many of us, started on a path to try to merge healthcare or health more broadly with the environmental sustainability realm. And so she established her own business that works to provide solar for residential um, from the health angle. And that's, that's kind of her, her shtick. Um, another example that I'll share, this individual isn't a health professional by background, but he um, sort of, well, he was worked with um, Healthcare Without Harm as uh, just an ally in the space for a while around blue wrap. Um, so this individual has um, worked to find some interesting innovations in the circular economy realm where they're collecting blue wrap in ORs primarily, and developing the technology to melt that down and actually shape that into other products that are then used in healthcare. So bedpans and emesis basins, some of those stories might sound familiar. They're doing that at um, the University of Vermont Medical Center. Um, and that concept of, you know, looking at the materials within the clinical practice workspace and thinking about, might there be another life after that? Um, it, it takes it takes somebody, I think, with some chutzpah to, to be able to take it to that entrepreneurial next level. Um, but at the same time, it starts by asking those questions and it starts by, you know, doing some research of what else might be out there in the community that's already embarking upon something like this that you might be able to draw from 
or replicate. Um, so I love that idea of, of innovation and entrepreneurship. And what better way to, you know, to learn about what's out there than connecting with folks like this. So, um, you know, whether it's on LinkedIn or um, some other professional spaces to learn more about what others in the industry are doing, I encourage that as, as part of building the community. Who else might you be able to partner with? That's great. And, and just in case um, uh, the blue wrap, I'll just make sure everyone knows that uh, those of the blue plastic very uh, water resistant, sterile, uh, or keep, keeps things clean with instruments that's often used at, in the OR. And that's like about 30% of the typical OR waste. And I'll have to say our, our one of our perioperative nurses, Barbara Belanger, who you may know, uh, has used a lot of the practice green health resources to help build out uh, blue wrap um, repurposing uh, as well through um, blue, um, Sorry, what's our uh, circular blue? I think that was the the agency, right? Yeah, lovely. Oh, that's great. And so I'll I'll, I'll suggest that anybody who wants to find out more can. I think there's a whole section about it on the Practice Green Health website. So um, get your institutions to do the same. Um, so uh, the other question, well, so I, I would like to just follow up that question about like thinking about how we do things and how we can change them to to decrease our our footprint and decrease waste. And a lot of what we do, I think, is because it's um, it's in the mind of first do no harm. We, we don't want to do in terms of infection control or we don't want to pass, we don't want to cause iatrogenic harm. So a lot of what we do is not really based on evidence necessarily and uh, based on policies that probably came from, um, I'm not even sure how they, they, they're born. So my question is, is there any role, has Healthcare Without Harm ever thought about taking um, a lead in either research in this space, like either whether it be nurturing, fostering, or um, financing, supporting research about some of these questions, like how we can do things better and, and actually creating evidence? That's kind of a vague question, but I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does. Thank you for that question. It's um. It's a complicated one too because of our our sort of nonprofit financing structure and the ways in which we work globally. So what you do bring to mind for me is some of the work that's happening out of Healthcare Without Harm Europe, especially related to some of their plastics and toxics reduction. Um, right now in the United States, there's not as much of a market unfortunately, for um, basically reusing or, or recycling or repurposing the materials that are coming out of healthcare, the, the case is different in Europe. And so there's a lot more momentum. Um, there are international convenings that are coming around plastics reduction in healthcare specifically, and we're behind the eight ball in this nation. We don't function in a way to, to drive research per se, um, we we do our best basically to um, serve as subject matter experts, but most of our um, most of the way that we work with public entities and health systems is more around the resource development that is based on best practice research that's out in the field. Um, so unfortunately, no, but it is definitely an area that if um, if we have the opportunity, we learn from others out in the community that would be interested in pursuing partnerships. We'd love to be able to offer that subject matter expertise um, where we can and pull their research back into our resources to put out. Wonderful. Well, I have to say it's been incredibly um, inspiring and uh, really helpful to have organizations like Healthcare Without Harm and Practice Green Health lead the way in so many things. And I think uh, it's um, it's they're wonderful organizations to get involved with, and and I really uh, liked how you ended the slide about building, uh, pitching the sustainability leader at your site because I feel like in this era, this day and age, every institution, every not just healthcare system, they really deserve and require that kind of leadership within um, sustainability. So I think the the case is easier now to to get that role developed um, with leadership. So. I'm glad that you brought that up. Uh, we just have um, not even a minute, so I'm just gonna see if we can get the last slide up. And while Lisa's bringing that up, I wanna say thank you again, Dr. DeMorest, for your time 
and this hour. And this will be recorded and sent to all our registrants and also on our website shortly. Um, and so I'll just close by inviting all of you to join us on April 4th, sorry, excuse me, April 1st, uh, Saturday morning. Uh, it's a virtual symposium and the topic will be uh, achieving sustainability through the perspectives on the individual level, healthcare system level and community policy level. Um, and then our next month's webinar will be Ed Maybach, who will be talking about the unique and important role of building public and political will for climate solutions um, by healthcare clinicians. So thank you again for joining us and thank you to Dr. Morris. Thank you everyone.